Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bruce Weston. I'm uh, the director of the Justice Lab and uh, professor of sociology here at uh, Columbia University. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our very first Justice Lab speaker series on social science research and justice uh, policy. Um, thank you everyone for joining us, uh, both in person uh, here at Columbia and online. Uh, before we uh, begin the talk, I, I'd like to take a minute to tell you a little bit about uh, this speaker series uh, that will run through this semester uh, and in the spring. Uh, we're hosting uh, a monthly uh, speaker series in which uh, we're inviting uh, uh, the speakers uh, to share with us uh, their experience uh, on the question, uh, how can research uh, contribute to reducing the scale of incarceration and other punishment? How can research contribute to making uh, communities safer and uh, promoting, uh, promoting social justice? Uh, information about the series and uh, registration information uh, is uh, available on our website uh, of the justice, at the Justice Lab. And uh, I want to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, ISEP, the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, and uh, former Columbia Dean Fred Harris uh, for making uh, this speaker series uh, possible. Uh, a couple of quick notes about our format uh, today. Uh, this is a, a Zoom webinar, and that means uh, that the audience members who uh, are dialed in uh, are muted with their videos off. Uh, I'm uh, speaking to you today uh, from the Justice Lab, and we have Michael Jacobson, uh, who is our inaugural uh, speaker in the series uh, today, uh, along with Justice Lab staff and uh, students and uh, affiliates. Uh, we're uh, reserving time at the uh, end of the hour that we have uh, to respond uh, to audience questions. If you're on Zoom, uh, you can use the Q&A feature uh, to pose questions at any time uh, throughout uh, the discussion. Our online moderator, uh, Sam Plummer, uh, will uh, select the uh, questions to uh, address uh, after this presentation. We'll also be taking questions from within uh, the room as well uh, to share with Michael. Uh, Sam, do you want to uh, jump in and and say anything? Uh, sure. Hi, I'm Sam Plummer. I'm a postdoc at the Justice Lab. And um, as Bruce mentioned, I'll be handling the online question and answer. Um, so I'll see you in a little bit after the presentation. Great. Uh, this event will be recorded and posted on the Justice Lab uh, websites. If you, if you have any technical questions too, uh, feel free to uh, ask them uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, but let me turn to our business today and uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Michael Jacobson uh, from uh, City University of New York uh, Graduate Center. Um, Mike is uh, the founding executive director of the uh, Inst Institute for State and Local Government at, uh, at CUNY. Uh, prior to joining CUNY uh, in uh, 2013, uh, uh, Mike was uh, president of the Vera Institute of New York. And I, I have to say, my, uh, Michael is uh, an, a, a very uh, special and important figure, I think, in, uh, in the criminal justice policy nationally and in New York City uh, specifically. Uh, uh, I think uh, you were really one of the pioneers at a, uh, at a very early stage uh, in uh, advocating in a very research-based uh, way uh, for decarceration. Uh, um, Mike published a, a, a terrific book back in 
2005, Downsizing Prisons, How to Reduce Crime and End uh, Mass Incarceration. At that time, I think that book was really uh, agenda setting, uh, decarceration, uh, I think is is now a, a dominant thread in the criminal uh, justice reform uh, conversation. But uh, back in 2005, uh, this was really uh, a pioneering effort. Uh, we were still uh, talking about re-entry policy, uh, small changes in, in drug policy, uh, and uh, downsizing prisons, I think, uh, was really uh, quite a paradigm shift in in the conversation. Um, Mike has uh, also been uh, the uh, the commissioner of uh, the Department of Corrections for uh, uh, New York City and presided over a really significant uh, decline in the size of the jail population and remains very active uh, in that discussion in New York City uh, today and has uh, made. Uh, just an enormous contribution nationally uh, to uh, jail decarceration uh, through the uh, the work of the MacArthur Foundation's uh, safety and justice. What's the challenge? Season? Challenge, <laughs> safety and justice challenge. So uh, we're really lucky to uh, to have Michael uh, kick off our speaker series today and help us investigate this question of uh, the relationship between uh, research and uh, decarceration uh, and progressive policy change in the criminal justice area. So let me uh, turn it over to Michael. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Bruce. Thanks for the lovely introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone, to the folks in the room and to the folks online. Um, so uh, my plan is to talk for uh, around a half hour, hopefully a little less, and save about the same amount of time for uh, questions. Um, I'm going to begin the talk with some overarching thoughts on the relationship between research, both sort of narrowly and broadly defined, um, and policy and practice in the criminal justice system, and then focus on, I, I wrote a couple, it might just be uh, one given time constraints of sort of real time uh, uh, examples of the dynamics that uh, Bruce was mentioning and that I'll talk about in terms of projects that uh, the Institute I head at CUNY, as Bruce mentioned, uh, is working on now. And we were an academic institute that does policy and research, and we partner with governments. That's what we do, um, uh, similar sort of to the, the work that we did at Vera. And so that's the perspective I'll be uh, using in my talk today. Um, and it clearly, for the uh, folks who, who live in this world, uh, uh, some of my introductory comments will um, be intuitive, if not familiar, uh, but just bear with me and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to some specific examples. Um, so in general, uh, I, I usually argue that there's no other public policy area uh, in government that has as large a gap between what we know and what we do um, than criminal justice policy. That is, when looking at the major substantive areas of domestic public policy, health, education, social services, infrastructure, and with the possible exception of environmental protection, uh, research in general, from what might be described as action research to peer-reviewed research, has a more limited role in policy and practice reform than in all these areas. Um, and why is that the case? Uh, it's a complicated question, but as folks like uh, Beckett, Simon, Garland, and others uh, have argued the intense and often toxic, uh, not to mention racist, politics around crime and punishment serve to pervert and at least inhibit rational, I use that word in quotes, crime and punishment policy. Uh, crime is an exceedingly emotional and democratic issue. Who knows anyone that hasn't been a real or imagined crime victim of sorts? It is a frightening, traumatic experience and issue that can be successfully exploited, even for those who live in areas 
that have incredibly low levels of crime. Think, for instance, of the upstate counties in New York that flipped from Democratic to Republican recently based largely on fears about crime driven by bail reform. Um, and interestingly, when you look at most of those counties, one of the first things that occurs to you is that uh, it's an issue that has almost nothing to do with any of their daily lives. Um, and by the way, and speaking of research, you know, all the research that's been done on the relationship um, between bail reform and crime, some of it done by us and a host of others, show that that relationship ex essentially um, is non-existent. As a result, it is a democratic issue in that it's rare to encounter someone, anyone, without an opinion about what crime policy should be, more harsh, less harsh, abolish, expand, defund, expand funding, <clears throat> reinvest in communities, uh, invest in police, et cetera, et cetera. Does everyone have an opinion on how to design high school special education services, how to build a multi-span bridge, how to ensure that developing urban areas have the capital infrastructure they need? Of course not. That's the province of experts. But now that expertise, and I use that word lightly here, in this case has moved over the last several decades in the US to national, state, and local legislators and officials who have found all sorts of ways to make political capital out of crime and punishment, the dynamics of policy development and reform is hugely complicated to say the least. Finally, one more note on this. What also defines this field is the power of individual high profile failures to have an outsized impact on policy development. Every field of course has examples of high profile failures. People graduate high school were functionally illiterate yet there are rarely calls for abolishing high school. Um, based on those failures, there are occasional collapses of bridges that cause immense damage and death, but instead of calls for no more bridges, there are usually some kind of sentinel event analyses, same for airplane, railroad crashes, et cetera, that result in policy and practice reforms. Not so in criminal justice, though the heroic efforts of people like James Doyle are pushing hard for these sorts of multi-stakeholder analyses <clears throat> in criminal justice. Just one high profile failure in say parole supervision, think Richard Davis's brutal killing of Polly Class in California, can lead to the end of discretionary parole and the creation of three strikes laws, one of the more miserable research free pieces of legislation and a pantheon of horrible legislative policymaking. Instead of recognizing that there will certainly be failures when dealing with a population that has been marginalized, generally, generally reside in areas of concentrated poverty, experience all sorts of racism and associated trauma of high degrees of mental illness, et cetera, et cetera, the political and public reaction to these cases is not infrequently, as Cohen and Young termed it, a moral panic that results in implementing policies that are in fact antithetical to extant research or at least best practice. Three strikes laws, Willie Horton and work release, all sorts of alternative to incarceration programs, reactions to New York bail reform, long or prison sentence, massive number of misdemeanor arrests, stop and frisk, brutal and inhumane prison conditions with no program programming or education, the list goes on and on. One final note on the context of policy reform and the role of research, um, and that is the specific role of budget and fiscal decision making, and in this case, criminal justice reform. A quick note on city and state budget offices, where I spent a good portion of my professional career. Um, these offices, especially in times of fiscal stress, i.e. now, um, have far, far more power to create and actually implement reform policies of all sorts than, say, probation, corrections, juvenile justice, and even police departments do. These agencies, even when run and managed by progressive agency heads, do not remotely have the power or frequently the will to move around tax levy funds, to reinvest tax levy dollars, to reduce and redirect their own budgets, or to implement new programs or policies out of whole cloth. Budget offices, in fact, do. But even to the extent that researchers in the field partner with or work with practitioners, more on this later, and a lot of them are in this room, or I suspect um, 
on the webinar, they rarely talk to work with or partner with those budget agencies. This is, in my opinion, a huge mistake and a lost opportunity. And to be clear, it is not remotely sufficient to buy those offices in with, for instance, a research finding or simple fact that, for instance, a jail bed on Rikers costs more than $500,000 a year, and the cost of an evidence-based alternative program, such as ROCA or the Center for Employment Opportunities, is a mere fraction of that. It is, of course, true, and it's important to point that out, but it's not remotely sufficient to begin to move funds out of, in this case, a jail system and into these programmatic areas. Partly, that's because researchers, understandably, don't get how budget offices work and make decisions, and it is an esoteric and non-transparent process by design. Budget officials are, of course, a cynical bunch by and large and tend to mistrust cost and savings estimates produced by researchers and certainly advocates. I like to think of myself as when I was a budget official, a fairly progressive budget official, um, and I didn't believe those estimates either. Um, yes, the average cost is $500,000 for a jail bed on Rikers, but you never save the average cost ever since there are so many fixed costs and you don't save anything unless you can actually close something, a dorm, a pod, a jail. And what you do save is the marginal or super marginal savings, <clears throat> which are still huge, just not that huge. And the startup costs of new programs can be substantial. And just because research shows that a small diversion or community-based program works, doesn't mean it can easily be taken to scale, which is a fundamental requirement and the ability to disinvest and reinvest in significant numbers. Is there, in fact, any research or experience on taking these programs to scale? What are the real costs and time for implementation? What are the failure rates? What are the financial and social costs of those rates? Best to have answers to these questions and to make your assumptions and estimates as conservative as possible, since the financial, not to mention social, community safety, and human costs of mass incarceration are so enormous. It won't be difficult, even with extremely conservative estimates, to ultimately make a convincing case for a host of alternatives, for instance, to jail and prisons. But more than that, issues that involve reducing funding for one area, say incarceration, and meaningfully investing in another area, alternatives, community-based not-for-profits, a la Sharkey and Torres Espinosa, do not happen immediately during an intense budget cycle, which now occurs several times a year, when budget offices go into their shells and are under tremendous pressure to balance budgets by law in many cases. And to assume that if they just understood that X is way cheaper than Y is enough to create policy reform is simply folly. On the other hand, my own experience with those offices and the officials who run them is that they, in fact, want to make wise use, scarce, wise use of scarce taxpayer funds. They are not colored necessarily by political ideology and are open to fact-based, substantive, evidence-based arguments. And they can be hugely huge allies for reform. But these are longer-term conversations. <clears throat> that continue through a number of budget cycles where they begin to understand the connection between research and fiscal policy and begin to help, in the best cases, chart a path forward for disinvestment and reinvestment sorts of decisions. They even, I would argue, welcome these conversations. And, and for researchers in general, there are no more powerful allies in government than the folks who control the money. That's true of individual offices, but also in terms of thinking about associations like the National Association of Budget Officers, the National Governors Association, and the National Association of Counties. Um, those are all avenues, in my opinion, worth exploring uh, when researchers think of partnering with practitioners. Not, not all practitioners. practitioners should be lumped into people that run the agencies <clears throat> you'd like to change. Um, last point on the context before I flip into a quick discussion of uh, one of the areas we're working in now. As you all know, there are mountains of research, evidence, data on so many areas in the justice system that are housed in God knows how many peer-reviewed journals, edited volumes, books and books chapters, and annual reviews of the literature that even most full-time academic researchers can't keep track of. For policymakers and practitioners who are just trying to get through the day without a disaster, 
and maybe have a bit of time left over to be more contemplative and thoughtful about long-term program and policy development, there is no way to thoughtfully digest and understand even the subset of the research that might be relevant or helpful to them. This is why places like the Council on Criminal Justice and Vital City here at Columbia are both engaging in pretty large scale translation efforts that can make complicated nuanced research accessible, digestible and understandable to both practitioners and elected officials. The lack of those sorts of efforts is a huge obstacle to making research more central to policymaking. Okay, <clears throat> enough of the political and fiscal context setting. Uh, let's turn now uh, to at least one of the issues and programs that uh, we're involved in that I think can highlight at least some of the dynamics I just talked about. So I'm gonna uh, bravely attempt to share the screen here. <clears throat> Oh, is that one? Oops. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I thought what I'd do is talk about one of the uh, programs that ISLG, uh, my institute, is involved in. Um, it's a, a some some of you may have heard of it. Uh, it's an effort uh, funded by the MacArthur Foundation called the Safety and Justice Challenge, as Bruce mentioned in his opening. Um, it will turn out to be probably a eight or nine year, about four hundred million dollar effort, and it has. Although it's a very sort of complex uh, uh, piece of work, it has two very simple goals uh, at its heart. They're not simple to, to achieve, but they're simple to talk about. One is um, to reduce the number of people in jails. <clears throat> uh, and MacArthur spent a long time sort of thinking about and planning where to do this work and decided uh, jails would be a good place. There's a fair amount of work historically on, on prisons, much less so in uh, in jails or a lot more jails. It's where the sort of American experience with incarceration is uh, almost 10 million people a year are admitted to jails <clears throat> compared to about 700,000 to prison. So the decision was made to work in jails and the two goals were as follows, uh, to reduce the number of people in jail um, and to reduce the racial and ethnic disparities of those people in those jails. Um, I could spend uh, far more time than I have to get into the details of this. So I'm gonna try to focus at a high level and, and tie it back to some of my opening remarks. Um, the way this works is that you can look at the slide. Um, though we, we work, uh, this is a place-based effort. Uh, we work with uh, local cities and counties and officials in those counties and research partners in those counties. Um, on a whole host of ways um, that they can use both our technical assistance and research um, to think about ways to change their policies to reduce incarceration and disparities. Uh, when we first set up uh, this effort about six years ago or so, seven years ago now maybe, um, and the, the way this initially worked is that we did a, an RFP, a sort of call for proposals from local counties uh, to join this effort and said, in order to, to do this, you're going to have to agree, you and the important uh, stakeholders in your counties are going to have to agree um, that these are going to be your goals. If you're in, you're in. Um, and we had no idea how many people would apply to that like 10, anyone, um, uh, we really had no clue. And in fact, we got around 150 applications from cities, counties, large, small, diverse geographically, diverse demographically, diverse politically. Um, so that was a good sign. Uh, and uh, clearly a will, both a willingness to participate in an effort like this. So there's some, there's some sort of will and interest there. <clears throat> um, 
but also, you know, this is the MacArthur Foundation, right? You get to be a MacArthur grantee. You get some money. Um, you know, there's some status associated with this too. And so that's that was probably no small thing in some of the counties that participated in this. Um, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of money on how the mechanics of this work. Basically, initially, we asked the counties. Um, this is one of the things I wrote about in the book, and and the the uh, um, this effort was based on the fact that these kinds of decarceration efforts have to be homegrown. That is, they have to be local. Um, the folks there in and outside government and communities have to come up with their own plans. Um, uh, this is was a very consciously not an, uh, an effort that was going to be driven by a bunch of uh, uh, fancy pants academics who are going to say, well, here, let us, let us tell you, here's, here's the way you're going to reduce your jails. And I think that's right. And that made sense. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I have to say, at least initially, some of the plans we saw, uh, um, were, were both kind of research free, uh, uh, and folks had no idea even who were in their systems, how to think about how to, um, how to, uh, how to reduce the size of those systems. Um, and, you know, some of the plans, they were not, shall we say, aspirational. You know, well, maybe we can reduce a few low level of fund, you know, offenders. We must have some, you know, choir boys coming in that we can. And, you know, there, there was a lot of time spent back and forth with, no, that's not going to do it, right? That's that it, we want big reductions, not marginal reductions. You have to think of ways to significantly reduce your systems. And a small diversion program that's politically acceptable to everyone is fine, but that's not going to be at the heart of um, what drives this. So there, there were a, a ton of back and forth, literally for years. Um, and eventually, I think a lot of these places, and you can see the 25 or so on the map, all have pretty substantial plans um, to reduce incarceration and disparities. And the reason I'm using this particular example um, is because the while the whole thing probably in the end will cost around 350 to $400 million, um, about 16 to 18% of that money, so give or take about $50 million is going directly to fund research um, to help and inform uh, these efforts. Uh, so uh, ISLG is probably the, the sort of largest single research um, grantee in this, but it includes the Center for Justice Innovation here, the VR Institute for Justice, the University of Missouri-St. Louis, Arizona State University, Loyola, Florida State University, UC Berkeley, Rutgers, the Rubin Institute at the University of Minnesota, the Urban Institute, the National um, Opinion Research Center. Um, a huge amount of research is being done for this effort, both, both that sort of translation research to help um, officials uh, keep track of their progress, to think about how to make progress, to think about ways to um, safely reduce uh, disparities, um, how to work with communities in an incredibly meaningful way, how to do participatory research. I mean, there's a ton of money that this is why I wanted to talk about this one, um, because it's a um, it's a very high profile example of the sort of use of research in changing policy. Um, and the last point I'll make about this is that in addition to these organizations both churning out original research for this. We run a research consortium where research is done on a variety of different kinds of issues. Um, we also, we ISLG, probably now have the largest database on jails uh, in the United States. We have individual case level data for years from these 25 um, cities, uh, policing data, corrections data, courts data, prosecution data. Um, it's a mammoth uh, data set, uh, the potential of which for researchers here um, is sort of unlimited and obvious. Um, okay, so, so given all that, what's happened? What are the results to date? Well, there's, I, I think generally, um, good news, uh, some mixed 
news. Um, uh, you can see the, let me see the, oh, okay, it's, um, you can see the, uh, the, there were two cohorts. I won't go into what differentiates the cohorts um, in the safety and justice challenge, <clears throat> but we have one cohort uh, with a number of cities, a second cohort with cities, both of which uh, minus, it's, I can't see the percentage, uh, I think it might be 22%, and the second one is 37% reduction in jail populations. Um, <clears throat> that's a very significant reduction, even over a number of years. Uh, we have way more uh, fine-grained um, data on this, but at a high level, um, you can see that that's what's happened uh, compared to the 15% reduction in uh, the national numbers. And just for the for the researchers among us, the comparison group here is not really just the national numbers. They're all sorts of uh, synthetic um, comparison groups uh, that we use uh, to measure this. They're, they're not on here, but the national numbers give you some sense of the, <clears throat> of the range we're talking about. Um, you can see one of the, uh, you know, sort of concerning dynamics here is that you can see the uh, the national numbers and the, the yellow line, which is the, <clears throat> the SJC sites, uh, both uh, started to go down pretty dramatically um, for obvious reasons during the pandemic. Um, the national numbers are still headed down, although I, I think our sense is this ends in 2021. They're, they're going back up now. Um, starting in 2022, uh, but the SJC sites also started to go back up, and uh, there are various hypotheses for that, one of which is that they um, already made a large deduction, COVID increased that reduction, um, and so New York City, for example, went down to about 3,500, 3,800 um, uh, during, the, during the pandemic, and, and we made an effort in the um, and the challenge to basically tell sites, okay, this is your new normal. <laughs> this is what we feel you can uh, sustain. Um, and that's been hard for some of them. So the lines are getting closer, but uh, we think they'll still remain pretty far apart. So uh, we're still pretty confident about that. The last point I'll make um, is on the um, is on the disparity side. Um, so there's two things about the disparities. This is a slightly more nuanced finding. Um, on, on the one hand, uh, the total jail populations declined and declined pretty significantly uh, for Blacks. Uh, so in terms of, you can see that on the, on the chart, um, the, you can, so on the one hand, clearly, um, there's a result of less harm overall for, we would argue, communities of color for um, Blacks in this case. Uh, uh, and, but when you think about disparities or relative rates, right, the disparity actually got worse, right? Because even though the percent of, uh, the percent reduction in Blacks, I'm gonna move this so I can see the exact percentage. Well, maybe I'm not gonna move it. Um, I just wanted to see that number here. Um, uh, don't worry about it. It's it's um, uh, maybe it's twelve or 16. oh, okay, sixteen percent. So not insignificant. Um, uh, the Latinx actually went up by twelve, but whites went down by twenty-five. Right, so that's not exactly what we were looking for. I mean, obviously we're looking uh, overall for fewer people to be incarcerated, so that's good. But we also know from the research that it's not, um, it's, it's not unusual for even when you provide alternatives to jail and prison, for those alternatives to be disproportionately offered to and used by whites instead of people of color. And you can see that playing out here. So, you know, this is a bit of a mixed result here, um, less harm overall, I think, and arguably, certainly for um, certainly for blacks and whites, not so much for Latinx. 
um, which is a not insignificant issue, um, and it requires much more work. And the, the last point I'll make on this um, is, uh, you know, to highlight some of my other point. Th this is, you know, this particular issue um, is just a very, very difficult. It's a difficult issue politically. It's hard for local policymakers to wrap their heads around this, to think they can do something about it, um, and uh, you know, they were sort of very open to having targets based on how much um, how much their jail population should be reduced, far less open uh, to us setting targets about what their uh, how much we wanted to see racial disparities reduced. So still a work in progress, but I guess my um, <clears throat> my sort of overall point here is that there's there's more to be done. And and this you know this this is in an effort that is rarely seen in sort of research and policy and practice circles and and even here um, success but but more work to be done it's a slog right this is a slog there are no sort of quick ways to get results here even when you can clearly point out that you know incredible harms to communities of these kind of policies so I'll um, I'll stop there and take any easy softball questions <laughs> that come my way. Brilliant. Uh, do we want to stop sharing? Mike, do you want to stop sharing? You want to oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, so uh, we'll take a uh, uh, Questions from uh, the webinar audience who are dialed in and questions from uh, uh, the room uh, here at the Justice Lab. And for the, uh, uh, Felipe, do you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah, um, very easy one. Um, <laughs> now we're talking. Um, I mean, I think it's really good that you have enough understanding for terms of all the officers. And um, um, you have any advice, because so many of the issues that you're talking about are not just, it's not a justice issue only. It has to do with, with health, it mm -hmm. has to do with education, it has to do with housing. Um, and budget offices tend to be kind of in silos like government. Um, any, any advice or ideas on how to handle that? Yeah, I mean, most of my advice really, I mean, I, I have some very specific advice because, you know, budget offices, as you say, like a lot of government agencies are get pretty siloed and there's people in budget offices that work on housing and other people on health, other people on justice. Sometimes they talk to each other, sometimes they don't. Um, I guess my overall point about those offices is that they, they can be navigated, right? You just have to start talking to them. And people, uh, people generally, certainly researchers, don't normally do that. Uh, you know, we, I, I, I have a ton of colleagues who work with uh, government agencies of all sorts, people, people here, and I, I work with them on working um, with uh, probation agencies on um, uh, reforming probation. But I, I guess my point is even for something like that, it, it's, you working, you have to work with probation agencies, for example, to reform probation, whether it's violation policy or different ways of uh, supervision or downsizing, but it will not remotely be enough to work with probation agencies. I mean, in this particular example, there, there, are, there probably are people in government that have less power and juice, as we like to say, than probation officials, but I can't imagine who they would be. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're just an underfunded, unappreciated, fairly invisible. And so as a result, they they have some power to do some interesting stuff. But if you if you can manage to convince a budget office both to be interested, to see the connections between not in, in probation, but to health, housing, et cetera, et cetera, you can have those conversations. So I don't I don't want to be overly sanguine about this. Like it's it's just easy to do. I guess my my overall advice is. In, in the same way that researchers now pretty consistently work with these sorts of agencies um, to do the same thing for budget offices. Uh, it's, it's a little intimidating, um, but in the end, uh, I, I think can, can only be a plus. Great. Uh, why don't we uh, turn now to uh, the webinar audience and uh, Sam, uh, I see there are a number of questions there in the Q&A box. 
Yes. Um, so our first question is from Eric Cadora, um, which states, uh, Mark Maurer famously challenged that if good research led to good criminal justice policy, we'd be in great shape, but we're not. What is the practical role of governance reform per se in shepherding good information to action, including cross-sector policy coordination and pooled and braided budgeting above and beyond electoral politics or narrowly targeted policy advocacy to establish more resilience to changing winds of political administrations or philanthropic fancies? <laughs> Eric, can you turn that into five words? <laughs> um, uh, okay, I, you know, I mean, really, there is no, you know, there is no trick here. I mean, I think you know, one of the tricks, and I, I think it's a nice development that over the years there are both individual researchers or research institutions that are very interested in reform and trying to work with the government agencies that ultimately are going to have to shepherd through that reform. Um, I think there's learning on all sides. That's true, uh, certainly for government officials, and it's also true for universities. You know, ju just because you're a university doesn't mean you automatically sort of understand um, <clears throat> the constraints of agency officials, the politics, the obstacles to reform. Um, and it takes a while to learn that. And, you know, I, I, I spent a long time thinking to a part of Eric's question about how, how for, for practitioners, um, you know, how can you increase their capacity and ability to use research findings, to understand research? Um, and, you know, I know from personal experience, I, I, I mean, I, I was a researcher of types. I had a PhD in sociology when I became the correction commissioner. I, I tried to <clears throat> keep current with the research. I tried to use it to the extent I could imagine using it. And even for me, it was incredibly difficult. The fact is, when I left corrections and wrote uh, the, my book on prisons, I probably at that point knew a lot more about corrections than I did when I was running corrections. And that's not an unusual dynamic. So, so really thinking through how to take these mountains of sometimes conflicting evidence, right? Sometimes strong evidence, sometimes weak evidence that, that again, researchers themselves have trouble sort of making sense of how do you how do you use that in a way that's helpful to policymakers that recognizes their constraints all the politics I was uh, yakking about initially it's it's a big challenge I I, I think my point Eric um, is generally that simplistically I suppose that that good solid research data evidence-based work is, essential to these kinds of reforms, whether it's ending mass incarceration, racial disparities, ending uh, um, <clears throat> uh, ineffective unjust policing, whatever it is, that kind of research is essential, but it's not sufficient. Um, any, any, any good researcher, I think, who's really interested in not just doing the research, but seeing it have some practical and policy effect also has to think about having a political, a fiscal strategy um, to get that research into the ether, to get practitioners to take it up. Um, but there is not a sort of slap on your head moment for most practitioners when they see, a, finally see a clinical trial with a, a you know, random uh, assignment study is that this is more effective than this. Um, that is not enough to affect change. Uh, hey, Michael, can I uh, totally abuse my chair's license and uh, jump in here? Um, uh, so, uh, so far, we've been uh, talking uh, mostly about uh, conversations, uh, collaborations between uh, researchers and uh and people in government mm -hmm. uh, running agencies uh uh is uh if if we're sort of considering the big question of how can research help make change in the world help make pro uh, uh, progressive change in the world 
should we be thinking about other kinds of relationships between re researchers as well with community organizations with uh, advocacy groups uh uh outside of uh, outside of government um is how should we be thinking about those relationships as as levers for change or is the real power in the conversation between uh researchers and government agencies and and policymakers. Yeah, no, it's an excellent question, and I, I mean, I, I concentrated on the on the researcher government piece of that for uh, you know both time constraints and uh, 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 the example I used. But those sorts of relationships, I would argue, and I'll circle back to some of the safety and justice challenge. The relationships with communities, um, impacted communities, uh, individuals with lived experience is essential to sort of getting change they're not these are not sort of mutually exclusive things you have to work with government um but you want to as as much as possible work with advocacy organizations uh work with communities um you know all you know sometimes there are different goals sometimes they're sort of overlapping but there's there there's usually uh you know some intersection where all their interests align and you know governments react to sort of social movements and they react to community pressure and um and it's incredibly helpful to get community involvement in these issues and involvement not in terms of just interest uh but oversight from actual research one of the things i didn't have all that much time to talk about is that while we have um a central part of the work here especially around racial disparities um, is to have the involvement of communities and it's a requirement in some ways uh, for folks to do participatory action research, right? Get get folks who are um, not just community members, but who are have been justice system involved to be some of the folks who are dealing with these issues, who are researching them, who are having those conversations with government. It's actually been a bit of a challenge. Um, I think it's it's there there are all sorts of good reasons, and there are a number of researchers and academic institutions that uh, really do great work around uh, participatory research. Um, but for a lot of those sites that you saw on that map, it's it's difficult for a lot of them to wrap their heads around this. So it's it's just more of a learning experience. But to your question, Bruce, yes, this is not just. Uh, a researcher government conversation that too is essential but not sufficient um i mean i can't think of any of these changes or any changes i've seen over the years and again you know there have been some significant changes yeah you know essentially the end of juvenile incarceration in california you know big declines in state and local jail populations etc cetera, etc cetera. you know they've rarely just been purely uh government driven right so the role of yeah. communities is great but but to me it's another it's an uh, it's another onus assuming a uh, you know big part of the audience here are academics and researchers it's another onus to think about how you're going to do that in some sort of coherent way where you're you're sort of working on an issue um that both and you know they're they're delegate sometimes you're both working with government but you're also sort of pressuring government um, you're you're working with advocacy organizations who sometimes sue government, uh, who governments don't love, and so it's a it's a balance. But they're they're hugely important. Uh, and if I if I had more time, I would have added that as a second piece of the talk. Great, uh, Sam. Uh, let's go back to you. Sure. Um, so I'm just going to put together a few different questions that were uh, related. Um, so uh, what would you say were the most successful changes or interventions implemented in the different SJC um, jurisdictions? And what policies were put in place to ensure those jurisdictions maintained their commitments um, to, to the goals of um, the safety and justice challenge? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And uh, um, let me start with the third, the last part of that question about the sustainability piece. Uh, this is this is a piece that keeps me up a little at night. 
um, because part of the issue here is that a number of these sites, while they've done great work and you can see some of the results, they've, they've gotten significant amount of funding from MacArthur. Um, I, I will always argue as I did um, and like most arguments I have, both personally and professionally, I lose. Um, but I, I don't think any site needs any money to do any of this um, uh, for a whole host of reasons I can talk about. Um, but the problem, and the problem with giving them money, you understand giving them money because it buys them in. Um, and it's amazing. It doesn't take that much fungible money for even big sites like New York, Chicago, Philadelphia to say, yeah, we'll take that money and join this program. Really? You, you have a hundred billion dollar budget. You're really interested in 1.5 million. And it turns out, yes, yes, they are because it's, it's fungible. It's play money. You can do whatever you want with it. So all that is to say, I do worry a little, and this goes back to my budget argument. I do worry a little that some of the policymakers who are used to seeing those funds, who have implemented some programs that have gotten those reductions, uh, will stop doing them after the money ends, which is one of the reasons I like getting budget offices involved in these discussions, because there's a path there to getting them to sustain these efforts, right? They're, they all are um, uh, uh, sort of financially positive for budget offices. So I, I I, do worry about that. You like to think they've had good experiences. It's best practice. They've gotten a lot of notoriety from them. They've done it safely. They get good press. So you like to think they'll be sustained, but I do, I do worry about um, the sustainability of this, uh, frankly, when the MacArthur money ultimately uh, dries up. You know, it's, it's hard to talk about the what's been successful and what's not because, I mean, part, as I said, part of the um, theory of change here is that, you know, this is hyper-local. Um, and I think that the, the foundation did a good job sort of understanding, you know, that incarceration, I mean, all criminal justice policy, but certainly incarceration policy is a hyper-local uh, um, thing in the United States. There is no national piece of work that's going to end mass incarceration here. It's work in 3,000 counties and um, 50 uh, states. So, you know, there are things that have worked in Pennington County, which is a little tribal area in uh, um, South Dakota. Uh, and what they've done is very different than Philadelphia. I have to say that a lot of the more successful uh, programs um, have resulted from some, some changes in police policy, uh, a fair amount of changing in prosecution policy, what gets charged and what doesn't. You know, a lot of diversion, you know, people love diversion. And I mean, again, I, I love diversion too. You're just not gonna get from here to there with diversion, but some good diversion programs, especially to uh, mental health programs. Um, the things that are the most effective just in terms of numbers, are always around case processing, right? I mean, the, the reducing the length of time it takes to process cases while on the one hand, an inside baseball mundane issue um, is what gets you the most reductions in any system. And just, just uh, I'll, I'll stop answering this question with this last point. Um, if you take the New York City jail system now, of which uh, uh, you know there's quite a bit of news, um, and the city is one of those that went down to about 3,800, and now Felipe probably knows is up over 6,000. So they've they've increased quite a bit. But the New York City jail, one of the reasons the New York City jail system is the size it is, is that a third of the people in Rikers Island now in the, in the system itself are there for a year or more. A third of them are there for two years or more. And about 500 of them are there for three years or more. Well, I mean, that's appalling at so many levels, I cannot tell you. Um, but it's also a, just a fundamental miscarriage of any notion of justice. You can't keep people that long in a jail. It's, not, it's, a, it's now used as a prison, especially that jail. But so to the extent if... if if the city had the times of disposition it had even 10 years ago, and 10 years ago, the city had miserable times of disposition. I mean, we're one of the worst in the country, but if we went back then, our jail population would be less than 4,000, right? So those things get you um, the, the most. There've been some sites that have done that really well. And I'll, I will say, given the politics of this, 
you know, there are sites that even now will say, wait, you want us to reduce the length of stays, that you want us to increase the disposition time, even for murderers? Yes, yes, that's exactly what we want you to do. I mean, even, but even there, even their pretrial, right there, and, you know, even you would think there'd be some sort of common understanding and agreement that no matter what you're charged, you want to get some speedy disposition of justice. Even that is not necessarily apparent. So, I mean, they're all over the map and the, the, the but we are categorizing every single one of them um, in terms of what they are and how successful they've been. Great. Uh, let me see if we have any uh, any questions uh, from uh, the room. Hi, I'm Ariel at 11. Okay. I'm a sophomore at Columbia. I'm an RA. Um, thank you so much for your words, Professor. Um, they especially spoke to me because both my parents were incarcerated and I'm, I'm double minority. Um, but I was wondering, in your line of work, you described it as intense, toxic, and racist politics. And I was wondering, despite like all the disparity research that you encounter, what did you hope? You know, and just to uh, repeat the question so everyone uh, uh, can hear it uh, online, uh, Ariel was asking, uh, in uh, the face of uh, racism and the toxicity of the politics, uh, what gives you hope? Yeah, you know, really, it's a it's it's a great question, and uh, you know, I, I well, a couple of things. I mean, one is, and I, I mean, I do have colleagues. I mean, understandably, who think let's just talk about mass incarceration for a second now, who are of the opinion that at this point you cannot and forget end you you cannot really even significantly reduce mass incarceration. It's too baked in. Um, the politics are too toxic. The dynamics of of these systems themselves that when they get so big, they sort of feed on themselves. The population just keeps stacking on each other, right there. And I mean, I, I get those arguments. I, I don't agree with them, sort of intellectually or substantively, but also because, I mean, as your question uh, um, uh, sort of foreshadows. I mean, I, I need some reason to, you know, get out of bed in the morning and and uh, have some reason to believe that there's good work to be done here. And and I think, you know, partly efforts like this, partly talking to policymakers all over the country. And and again, you know, there's been so much. Let's keep talking about mass incarceration. There's been so much work. Uh, you know, critical work, research, you know, the literature on the ills of mass incarceration. I mean, I don't even know how to describe it now. It's just so voluminous. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, as Mark Maurer might have said, or I would have said, well, if that was enough to end mass incarceration, right, it would have been ended. Um, so it's clearly not enough, but it has permeated, right? I mean, we, we rarely speak um, to any government officials, even again, we work at the local level so that politics are not as toxic as they are nationally. We don't speak to a lot of people who are happy with the levels or types of incarceration in their places, even in systems that they run, right? Their challenge by and large is not a, a, a sort of challenge of viewpoint or a challenge of ideology. It's, it's how do I do this? You know, I can't wave a magic wand and just, you know, I can't open the doors. I, you know, I need some way that sort of protects me politically, but where where I can, you know, get these systems not just sized, but operate in a humane, dignified way. You know, we just, and I, I find that even now kind of heartening. I mean, it's no, it's not a small problem to have, but we don't get a lot of, like, ideological pushback from the folks that run these systems. And that's, I think, largely due to, you know, incredible community work, social movement work, work of the advocates, researchers. Um, but, the, you know, the piece that's, you know, sort of missing, which is the, what the MacArthur program is designed to do is, you know, what's the path forward for me? And that, you know, that's going to be different in every, 
in every place. But I am, you know, there have been some successes, even in the national level outside this. You know, you can see there are, you know, reductions in prison populations, not everywhere, but all over the country in jail populations. There have been, you know, if you look at uniform crime reports, there are probably six million fewer arrests you know, uh, last year than there were seven or eight years before. I mean, there's there's it there's hope, right? Um, uh, and again, I I'm not um, I'm a pretty cynical person uh, by and large, I think, but I I I I have a fair amount of hope because I see a lot of people with uh, goodwill, good intentions, and that's again true on the sort of community side, the academic side, the government side. Um, there, there, there is a path forward here, but I, I, I guess my point is it's a, it's a slog and it's a commitment and it took us 50 years to get to the levels we're in. It's, it's not going to disappear in three years, but the nice thing about this field is even incremental change year to year affects, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of people. So, um, you know, um, there's, there's a book about this written by a couple of my colleagues, uh, Greg Berman and Aubrey Fox, called Gradual, which is, uh, you know, their, their defense of incremental change. Um, young people don't tend to love their book, but, but, it's, but it is, again, you know, the, the, in, in mass incarceration especially, um, the, the hyper massness of it means that you know, even if you can make year to year, 2%, 3%, you know, those are, those are big changes. So, and, and I, you know, I, I am pretty hopeful that I can, I can, the project I'm working on now is, um, I, I, I don't like the term reducing mass incarceration, because I don't know what it means. Um, and even when people say the words ending mass incarceration, for me, it's not enough. Like, what does that mean? Uh, what is ending mass incarceration? You know, for me, it's, a, it's not just a, a concept. It's a, it's a number. I actually have a number. But, you know, in my head, I think, you know, it's possible to get there. I think it's possible to do. It's just, it's just very difficult and requires just intense work at very, very local levels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this uh, this issue of uh, how how do we do it uh, uh, strikes me as uh, fundamental to the problem of decarceration and and maybe uh, this is a, a question uh, uh, that researchers uh, haven't fully uh, committed to yet and and I think uh, this is a, a really fertile agenda for us. I, I think it's a, uh, a wonderful note uh, on which to end. Uh, so I invite everyone to uh, join me in uh, thanking Mike for a, a terrific kickoff uh, to our speaker series uh, for this year. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you. Uh, we will be back on October 9th. Uh, that's uh, uh, the next date in our calendar uh, where we will hear from Robert Vargas, uh, Professor of Sociology at the University of Chicago. Thanks very much, everyone.